Um, so I, I think Giacomo did my job, so I'm going to skip many slides and jump to uh, an interesting part of this presentation that I think complements uh, what has been said. I think the conflict of interest here is negligible. So we have talked about the importance of driving pressure and now we would like to measure this during assisted ventilation because uh, or spontaneous ventilation as the team has uh, alluded and made it a, a stress the importance but I would like you to, to remember uh, that in the seminal papers about ventilator-induced lung injury it doesn't matter if you produce uh, a certain type of volume by positive pressure ventilation or negative pressure ventilation the consequences on the respiratory system are the same I mean for the lung injury uh, measured by these bars disease permeability, disease wet and dry lung ratio and in fact it's a little bit worse because you have a, a let's say a, a, an increased lung edema because of the vascular conditions are a little bit different so damage is the same if not worse when produced by the muscles if you have the same gradient of pressures applied across the respiratory system um, and then Giacomo has talked about this comparison of compliance during assisted or, uh, or controlled mechanical ventilation I'm going to skip this and but I would like to stress this so typically when uh, when we see a patient under spontaneous ventilation especially pressure support we have to think that the total driving pressure is the sum of what the muscles and the ventilator is doing. This looks obvious, but the, the amount of patients I have seen that uh, the physician at the bedside was not paying attention to this, it's unbelievable. I would say that it's much more uh, than, let's say, 50%. It's something that uh, it, it, it's striking. And uh, especially when you have this concept in mind that your total driving pressure is always tidal volume divided by compliance. Because when you do this calculation at the bedside, you realize that many patients with five of pressure support, they have driving pressures like 30 or 40 centimeters of water. I have seen this many times. And then I think there is three major reasons why uh, physicians don't pay attention to this when the patient is under pressure support. The first one is I call a religion factor because some people believe that just because it is spontaneous it's better than mechanical. Uh, I'm not going to enter this but I, I believe that this is an important factor that some people still believe that spontaneous ventilation is good. For, because it's natural. Uh, so we should avoid these by all means. The second one, Giacomo has told you also that uh, for some reason uh, physicians they think that the total driving pressure is just the level of pressure support. This is an absolute mistake. Um, and then obviously you have to take into account the muscle driving pressure. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this that in areas suffering pendulum, the driving pressure in that region is above the global driving pressure that you can calculate at the bedside. And so this is really an occult and impossible to calculate factor at the bedside. So these are two important factors. The paper of Takeshi was discussed already here. I would like to keep in mind for you a very beautiful picture uh, in these papers. This is a patient uh, during pressure controlled ventilation. This is the lung edema in uh, green. And then a few minutes later, the patient is going to start his muscle effort, is going to do assisted pressure controlled ventilation. This is what happened immediately. Oxygenation improves. Looks like the image is better. The lung gets aerated. And you have to remember that you are doing here the same mistake we did many years ago when we started to use high tidal volume. 
This is tidal recruitment and recruitment produced by higher driving pressure and higher tidal volume. So you are going to pay a price and Takeshi showed that six hours later this is the scenario. So we have to avoid this. And there are two beautiful papers showing this. Okay, that previous picture you could get some estimate by doing the calculation I have told you. Divide tidal volume by compliance, which you can calculate, for instance, with the method proposed by Bellani. And then you realize that you are giving too much driving pressure for a patient, and as a rule of thumb, we try to avoid driving pressures above 13 to 15 centimeters of water. But um, five years ago, we were monitoring some patients uh, at the Heart Institute in my university. And then, this is the typical scenario of a patient under pressure-controlled ventilation. And when I see this picture, I know that the patient has the right amount of PEEP, the lung is in a good shape because it's a homogeneous inflation, and the distribution of ventilation looks like very well balanced. So this is a typical scenario when the patient is using reasonable level of PEEP, so I'm very comfortable with this image. But uh, I was surprised to see a few minutes later that the patient was doing like, something like this. And uh, I was very intrigued because the start of ventilation was in the dependent line, and this was absolutely the opposite I would predict from my previous studies with CT. And then, at, this was the time when we came to this concept of Pendeluft because we were intrigued about the starting of inspiration in the dependent lung region. And we know that during controlled mechanical ventilation should be opposite. And then uh, we, we did lots of validation studies, but I, I ask you to pay attention to this. Look at this image here. This is an animal in which we try to reproduce this observation in patients. This is the diaphragm. But the, the interesting thing is that the diaphragm is appearing here during the beginning of inspiration. This was the very surprise. So this is not an exhalation. This is the beginning of inspiration. So, which means that this region is deflating at the beginning of inspiration. And this is the trigger of all the studies about the Pendeluft. And then we proved uh, using EIT that the beginning of inspiration in the non-dependent zone, you have a deflation of the lung, while you are having a big push of the diaphragm in the dependent zone. And then when the patient is paralyzed, they, they stretch in the dependent lung zones, they are much smaller. Pay attention, the global tidal volume here and here, so assisted and controlled mechanical is exactly the same, and both situations the patient was receiving 6 ml per kilogram. What is this number is representing here? Is that, okay, after we saw this amount of stretch, we, we decided to do the following experiment at the bedside. Let's try to reproduce the same amount of stretch during completely controlled mechanical ventilation. And then we paralyzed the patient, the stretch was very low, and then we started to increase tidal volume to the point that we saw the same stretch in the lower lung zones. And to our surprise, we had to go up to 15 mL per kilogram of tidal volume to get exactly the same stretch. And this is why we are now saying that when you have Pendeluft, you have a much larger tidal volume directed to some specific regions of the lung. So, strong efforts producing Pendeluft, they cause dorsal overstretch. This was very well demonstrated despite the same tidal volume. And this is a representation of the concept of Pendeluft, you are sucking air not from the ventilator but from the non-dependent lung zones because, it, because you have a very strong contraction of the diaphragm. And uh, we, we did some 
ancillary studies to establish the conditions uh, that uh, cause the pendeluft. And we realized that it's a combination of severe telectasis and strong efforts of the diaphragm causing some force concentration. More or less, the cartoon of a dependeluft is something like this. You are doing your, with your parenchyma something like this. You are doing such a strong effort and you are concentrating so much the force of the diaphragm that you are causing uh, a kind of uh, amplification of the movement of the lung in this way so the lung is not behaving like a gas or liquid body any longer and it's suffering a big deformation and sucking air from the upper part. We proved that this was true with pleural sensors and we have shown that very close to the diaphragm you can see a concentration of forces, a, a swing in pleural pressure of minus 20 at the same time that the esophageal balloon was showing us only, sorry, the esophageal balloon was showing only 8 centimeters of water, and this was very well calibrated. And then we proved that this region gets overinflated in the CT, and not only this, we have inflammation, local inflammation. So, animal ventilated with protective tidal volume gets overstretched, monitored by EIT, so proved by EIT, and also by PET scan, this region concentrates inflammation. In interesting enough, this concentration of inflammation is very different from what we found during controlled mechanical ventilation, in which the inflammation accumulates in the upper lung or the most ventilated lung. And um, we, using EIT, you can localize the pixels in the image that are suffering the pendeluft, the regions receiving the extra stretch, because you have the donating regions and the receivers region. And these are the receiving gas region, and they are exactly the same that are getting inflamed because you have an overstretch. And then using EIT, you can more or less calculate how much is the specific tidal volume to that region. And then despite the fact that the global tidal volume was 7, this region was receiving 14. The consequences in many animals were, were dramatic. After 24 hours of pain in the luft with 6 animals per kilogram tidal volume, you have huge inflammation. And so, this is one example, and uh, this is um, the online monitoring of Pendeluft. You see that these regions, they are representing, receiving an extra tidal volume equivalent to 9, 10, sometimes 11 ml per kilogram. This is a, a, a graph that uh, is fre frequently forgotten and in the original paper. This is... Uh, in the original paper published in 2013. This is the stretch measured by EIT, and at the same time, this is the local transpulmonary pressure. This is what was happening uh, when the animal was spontaneously breathing, we paralyzed, sorry, one second. We paralyzed the animal, and then the local stretch decreased a lot. And then we started to increase artificially the tidal volume to the point that we got back to the same stretch. And this is how we came to the conclusion that sometimes you have to increase your tidal volume to 15 ml per kilogram and also your total driving pressure to 25 centimeters of water to get back. But interesting in this graph is that the, there is a linear correlation between the local stretch and the local transpulmonary pressure that you have to apply. So it looks like that the compliance of the lung is homogeneously distributed. And then to get the same stretch, I need a, a, a much larger local driving pressure. And this is why now we believe that when we are going to display online the pendeluf, we are going to try to display also how much is the local driving pressure caused by the pendeluf. I know that, okay, global tidal volume is seven, the regional tidal volume goes to 14 in these regions, 
and then the local driving pressure is very high. So, in areas suffering pendulum, the local driving pressure can be much larger than what you can calculate at the bedside. So I always like to do this calculation, and we can use the method that Giacomo proposed. And then, for instance, a, as a rule of thumb, we could do something like this. If your global driving pressure is below 12, 13, move on, maybe you keep the spontaneous ventilation because you don't want to step back and paralyze the patient again. But if it's above 15, maybe you have to step back. And, pay attention to this, if it's below 12, but with pendulum, which you can monitor with EIT, very likely you have to step back also because this 12 is absolutely underestimated and this region may be suffering. Um, so, I would like, um, my time is over. Okay, then I stop here. I, I was proposing two strategies at the bedside to step back, but we keep this for the <laughs> presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcelo. If there are any questions? In the meantime, I have a question. If at the bedside,